it's my privilege to introduce the honoree and keynote speaker for our 10th Michael and Susan Dell Lectureship in Child Health, United States Surgeon General and Vice Admiral Vivek Murthy. Before going through some of the highlights of Dr. Murthy's impressive background, I'd like to first give a more general introduction of the office he represents and why he has been selected for this year's lectureship. It's a question he's probably heard many times since he was confirmed in the office in December 2014, and that's, what does a Surgeon General do? Well, I'm sure Dr. Murthy can provide a much more detailed response. I'm going to tell you what the office has done for public health, specifically in the area of health promotion and disease prevention. Some of the first things people think of when they hear the word Surgeon General tie right in with disease prevention, Surgeon General's reports and the Surgeon General's warning labels on tobacco and alcohol products. These two examples, the reports and the labels, nicely re represent the essence of the Surgeon General's role in public health. So first, the reports. When the Office of the Surgeon Gen General publishes a report or a call to action, the world pays attention. That's because these reports represent years, and as someone who's been involved in the process, I mean years, of rigorous scientific review, analysis, um, and involvement of colleagues. In the academic world, the Surgeon General's report represents the state of the science on a given subject. Second, regarding warning labels. Warning labels exemplify the Surgeon General's other major role in disease prevention, that of translator and communicator of science and medicine for the American people. Dr. Murthy is America's doctor. And like all good doctors, he isn't just interested in treating disease or mending broken bones. He is interested in ensuring you stay healthy, don't get sick, or have an injury, if at all possible. And that brings me to the reason why we chose Dr. Murthy as this year's Michael and Susan Dell Lectureship in Child Health honoree. Even before taking on the role of Surgeon General, Dr. Murthy has championed the idea of wellness and health as universal human rights. As the Surgeon General, he has emphasized the need to, quote, build a culture of prevention in our country. Dr. Murthy has devoted himself to improving public health through the multiple avenues of service, clinical care, research, education, and entrepreneurship. After earning his bachelor's degree from Harvard and his MD and MBA degrees from Yale, he completed residency training in Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School in Boston, where he later joined the faculty as an internal medicine physician and instructor. And this will be very hard to believe when you see how young Dr. Murthy is that he's done all this. And as a clinical educator, Dr. Murthy has cared for thousands of patients and trained hundreds of residents and medical students. Dr. Murthy is also a healthcare entrepreneur who launched a successful software technology company, Trial Networks, to improve research collaboration and enhance the efficiency of clinical trials around the world. To date, these clinical trials have reached over 50,000 patients in more than 75 countries. More recently, Dr. Murthy served as the president of Doctors for America, a nonprofit organization comprised of more than 16,000 physicians and medical students in all 50 states who work with patients and policymakers to build a high quality, affordable health care system for all. It's clear that Dr. Murthy understands the importance of prevention in the promotion of health both here and in the, in the U.S. and globally, and shares our vision of healthy children in a healthy world. We believe he embodies the essence of this award, and we are delighted to have him as our 10th Michael and Susan Dell Lectureship and Child Health Award recipient. So please warmly uh, welcome United, uh, the 19th United States Surgeon General, Vice Admiral Vivek Murthy.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Dr. Perry, for the very kind introduction. And I must tell all of you how happy I am to be here in Texas. Now, I've only been to Austin once before. It was at a uh, very rakish Indian wedding. So I didn't get to see much of the town. I was stuck in a ballroom. <laughs> but I'm happy to, to be here a second time around and to see the, the campus, because this is uh, where I understand great things happen. Uh, because according to my chief of staff, who's an alum of, the, of UT Austin, uh, this is where the action's at. So here I am. I also want to thank the leadership uh, of, of the center, the Dell Center for Healthy Living, for the tremendous work that they have done to advance the health of children and communities, and for going beyond research and seeing how we can integrate research into communities uh, through real-time application. That is so important. Now, as Dr. Perry mentioned, uh, you know, my job is, is one that is steeped in many, many years of legacy uh, based on the 18 Surgeons General who came before me. And I'll tell you what my job is. Uh, my job is to help people and communities understand how to improve their health. My job is also to command the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps, which comprises 6,700 officers who wear uniforms just like this, whose sole mission is to protect and defend the health of the people in the United States and around the world. Now, you might ask, why am I telling you all of this? Well, I'm telling you this because I've realized as I've traveled that most people have no idea what I do. <laughs> they know my title, but they really don't know what I do. In fact, I came to see this quite starkly uh, some months ago when I was boarding a flight. And uh, I was on the, the walkway into the plane. And the woman in front of me looked back at me and she said, oh, she said, why don't you go ahead of me? I said, no, ma'am, I'm, I'm happy to wait. She's like, no, but without you, we can't fly the plane. <laughs> So I thought it would be worth clarifying right now. <laughs> but in all seriousness, it, it's a real privilege and honor to serve as Surgeon General. And on a serious note, I wanted to share with you that just, just a few weeks ago, I was in Flint, Michigan, where I was meeting with families uh, that were impacted by the terrible water crisis that you've all probably read about in the newspapers. And like much of the country, I was struck and distressed by the tragic irony that in the richest country in the world, thousands of our brothers and sisters can't trust the water that comes out of their faucets. And in Flint, when I was there, I had the chance to hear from healthcare practitioners. I had the chance to speak with community organizations that were going to homes to make sure the people had water and they had the information they needed. And I also had the chance to go door to door myself and visit families and sit down with them and talk to them about their experiences. And as I sat in one couple's living room uh, with their two daughters, I remember feeling the pain and the anger that was coming from them. It was so clear in their voices as they told me how they had to live with knowing that for the past two years, they had allowed their children to drink water that had been contaminated with lead. Now, to be clear, this was not the fault of the parents. But they felt the way that most parents do, that their children are their most important responsibility, and that taking care of them was a sacred charge. And they kept asking themselves, how could we do better by our children? How could we do better? by our children. Now, there is much work ahead in Flint. And that question, how can we do better by our children, will be on the minds of parents in Flint for a very long time. But what I hadn't expected to see in Flint was actually Flint's greatest asset, the fierce determination, strength, and pride of its residents. They were committed to rebuilding the town in which they were raised. And despite everything that could happen, they had seen and still believed in the possibility of what Flint could be. And they wanted to be right there fighting to make that possibility into something real. Now, it turns out that Flint has a lot to teach the rest of the nation. The question they are asking is one that all of us should be asking, 
more broadly, which is how can we do better by our children, the nation's children? And in answering that question, we must remember that despite how hopeless the news headlines may seem, when you turn on the TV or click on a news website, we must believe and remember that our nation is full of extraordinary people who have brilliant minds, who have good hearts, and who are committed to making our communities stronger. I say this not just because it's a good theory. I say it because I've met these people as I've traveled across the country. And it's these people who remain our greatest strength as a nation and our best hope of creating the future that our children so richly deserve. Now, over the last year and a couple months since I began as Surgeon General, I've had the chance to sit down and talk to parents and children in small towns and in big cities all across America. I've had a chance to sit down with teachers and nurses and doctors and talk to them about what's on their mind, about what concerns them. And often people share the concerns they have about raising children in 2016. Some wring their hands at the fact that many of their neighborhoods are unsafe for their kids to do what every child should be able to do, which is take a walk, play in the park, or just run around with their friends. Other parents are worried that drugs will steal their children's future, and still others worry that one in three of our children are overweight or obese that more children are developing type 2 diabetes than we ever thought possible, and that mental illness remains a challenge for children of all backgrounds. Now, many of these conversations have convinced me that if we really want to safeguard the health of our children, if we want them to be able to live up to their full potential and bounce back when hardship strikes, then we have to think deeply about how to create a foundation of health for our children that will serve them for the rest of their lives. This is important because health to all of us is more than a set of lab values or a list of illnesses deferred. Health is about opportunity. It's the key to opportunity and no one deserves opportunity more than our children. I believe that the foundation for a healthy life is tied to a culture of prevention, one that's anchored in physical activity in good nutrition, and in emotional well-being. And I also believe that an effective foundation for health must be inclusive and equitable, bringing the benefits of treatment and prevention to all children, regardless of where they live or the color of their skin. In order to build this foundation for health, I believe that there are four key steps that we have to take. And that's what I want to share with you today. First, we must figure out how to create a culture where healthy is equated with happiness and what children want. Right now, choosing healthy options is too often associated with pain. You all know what I mean. And if you don't, just think about that old saying that some of us grew up with, that you have to suck it up and just eat your spinach. That wasn't based on the idea that spinach is a source of pleasure. And think also about the cues that children pick up on about exercise being a chore, a chore that you do even though you'd rather be sitting on the couch with your friends. And many people, in fact, some of these people are my friends, have told me that <laughs> the easiest way they figure out what's, what tastes good on a restaurant menu is to look at what has the word healthy behind and next to it and to not choose that. <laughs> so we have, as I think of it, a branding problem when it comes to health. And we have to shift the pursuit of health from being a source of pain to being a source of pleasure and even a source of power. The good news is that this is possible, and it's particularly possible for children. And I've had the chance to visit some schools that are doing exactly this. When I was in Roanoke, Virginia, I had the opportunity to visit the Healthy Chefs program, which is bringing children in and understanding, first of all, what their favorite foods are. And what they found was that the kids almost always named the big three on their list. Now, you can probably guess what the big three are, but they included pizza, <laughs> hot dogs, and macaroni and cheese. <laughs> My guess is that those might be on some of your lists too, <laughs> and that's okay. Because what they did at the school in, in Roanoke is they began by exposing children to fruits and vegetables early, 
Their idea was to help kids develop a fun and positive relationship with fruits and vegetables. And they did it not just by showing them fruits and vegetables, but by helping them prepare dishes with fruits and vegetables. And something amazing happened, which is over time, the kids' preferences started to shift. The big three didn't go away entirely, but in many cases they were replaced by the fruits and vegetables and dishes that the kids experienced in the class. And then something else happened, which is the kids would go home and they would ask their parents for that food. The parents sometimes wouldn't know what to do, so they would call the school, which was prepared, with the recipes and directions on where to pick up those fruits and vegetables at affordable prices. So through that program, the Healthy Chefs Initiative is helping kids redefine their relationship with food, helping making fruits and vegetables a source of pleasure, not a source of pain. The second point, which has become clear to me, is that we can't change health behaviors in sustainable ways until we change the environment in which our children live. Too many children live in neighborhoods where physical activity is a challenge because of violence and road safety concerns. Many children also spend much of their lives surrounded by junk food, in vending machines, in school cafeterias, and in advertisements, which has been proven to have an impact on the food choices that children make. And for too many parents, providing fresh fruits and vegetables is simply too hard because of either cost or availability or both. In Flint, for example, for a town of nearly 90,000 people, there isn't one single full-service grocery store. Not one. Now, creating an environment that supports health is not easy. It means pushing back against the forces that want to advertise junk food to our children, including soda. It means speaking up for the inclusion of healthy foods in our cafeterias and schools. And it means convincing city councils that making neighborhoods safer and more walkable should be a public health priority. Some cities have been able to do this. In West Wabasso, which is a small city in Florida, a city which has its share of struggles with a sizable number of people living at or below the federal poverty line, they realize this connection between safety and walkability and health. And that's why they invested in building sidewalks, installing lighting, cleaning up vacant lots and converting them into parks. And they found that just a couple of years after they made those changes, 95% of residents, when surveyed, reported that their physical activity had increased. 95%. And when asked why, the most common reason they cited was the increase in safe and walkable spaces. That's a pretty remarkable result. The third point that I've come to, is one that I've come to believe even more deeply than ever before. And that's that in order to improve the health of our children, we cannot focus solely on the body, but we must also focus on the mind and the spirit. So many of the conversations that I've had with families as I have traveled have been about the costs of depression and anxiety. It takes an average of 10 years to diagnose mental illness after symptoms start. And the initial symptoms often present during childhood. Alarming numbers of our children are also experiencing high levels of stress from isolation, from violence, from family life, strife, and from the all too common experience of discrimination. Now I learned early in my medical internship that you could put all the effort in the world into figuring out the right blood pressure medicines for someone, the right insulin regimen, the right antibiotics for their infection. But if they were dealing with untreated mental illness, or if their level of emotional well-being was low, then their ability to take medicines and to follow up with their appointments was severely limited. We can't divorce the health of the body from the health of the mind and the spirit. And we have to do better when it comes to identifying mental illness early and connecting children and families with help. But I also believe we have to focus on improving emotional well-being for all children. Because emotional well-being is not just the absence of mental illness. It's also a resource that all of us have that we can cultivate and strengthen that can help us reach our full potential. 
The good news is that there are programs that are cultivating and building emotional well-being with remarkable results. In Chicago, the Becoming a Man program is one that brings at-risk young men together once a week for mentorship, for lessons on conflict resolution, and for fellowship. And in just a year, in a randomized controlled clinical trial, the Becoming a Man program was shown to reduce violent arrests by 44%. 44% in a city that is riddled with violence. That's pretty remarkable. And in San Francisco, a middle school that I visited just a few months ago has been implementing a meditation-based emotional well-being program. And what they have been able to do is go from a school that was riddled with violence and suspensions to achieving within one year a 45% reduction in suspensions, improved anxiety and sleep among students, significantly improved grades and test scores, and much happier parents as well. And all of these results have been replicated and seen in other schools as well. So these examples are powerful, but they're happening on a small scale. And the challenge before us is how do we study these more? How do we scale them up so the benefits of emotional well-being programs can be brought to more and more children in America? And the fourth and final thing that we must do to build a foundation of health for our children is perhaps one that you wouldn't expect me to say, but I believe it's perhaps the most important, which is that we must cultivate the ability of children to give and to receive kindness. Kindness is not just a virtue. It's not just a value, but it's actually a source of healing. This isn't something I learned in medical school. I wasn't tested on it on the boards. But it is something that I learned by caring for patients, something I understood by seeing the growing literature on the impact of meaning and happiness on health, something I came to understand and believe by listening to the countless stories of children and adults that I encountered in the United States and abroad. Now, too often, our culture our media and our politics teach us that expressions of kindness, whether they be compassion, generosity, or forgiveness, are signs of weakness. But there's nothing weak about kindness. Some of the most successful people in our nation's history trace the origins of their strength and success to the kindness of a parent, a teacher, or a close friend. The kindness of Mother Teresa moved governments moved institutions, and inspired millions of people. And it was the kindness of boat captains on the Hudson River in New York who ferried nearly half a million people to safety on 9-11. And it was that kindness that inspired millions of Americans during one of our darkest hours. Kindness, it turns out, may very well be one of our greatest sources of strength. So the question for us is, can we help our kids see kindness as a source of strength and not a weakness? Can we help create a culture of kindness in our families, in our communities, and in our institutions? And can we be role models for kindness in how we treat others, especially those who may differ for us in background or viewpoints? These four steps that I've shared with you today, these can help us build a foundation for health that will serve our children and our country. At a time when chronic illnesses have skyrocketed and where healthcare costs are far too high, the need for this foundation could not be more urgent. And this is personal to me, and I'll, and I'll tell you why. Because years ago, in a small farming village in India, my paternal grandfather was struggling to raise six children after his wife had died from tuberculosis. And there were many days where my father and his siblings didn't have enough food to eat. They would take the grain that they had, they would boil it, and they would dilute it with water again and again until there was enough volume to fill each of their bowls. Yet despite not having enough food for the family, my grandfather would take a month out of the year and travel from village to village, collecting money to help build a youth hostel for students in the village. Now, people told him he was 
irresponsible. They said, at a time when your own family can't eat, what business do you have going around and doing charity work? Don't you know what your responsibilities are? And he would listen to them patiently. He would think about it. And he would always reply, well, those children are our children too. <laughs> America's children are our children. And every child's birthright should be a strong foundation for health. Recognizing that good health is the key to opportunity. We need a renewed commitment in our country to strengthen our nation, child by child, family by family, neighborhood by neighborhood. We need to restore a sense of optimism in our country that inspires people to choose possibility over pessimism. And we need to ensure that health is no longer a barrier that puts the dreams of a child beyond their reach for no fault of their own. That's our charge. That's our collective responsibility. I have always believed that the world gets better when people choose to come together and to make it so. And now more than ever before, I believe that those people must be us. Thank you very much.